Okay, piked dogfish. Piked dogfish. This is Squalus acanthius. Squalus acanthius. That is Latin for a spiny kind of sea fish. Um, it was named by Linnaeus, the original taxonomist, the guy who made it cool, in 1758. Mm. And this is a shark that Americans like to call spiny dogfish. Um, so, but what's interesting is that piked dogfish is the proper name. And what I mean by that is that the United Nations has this body um, called the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO. And FAO produces a lot of shark guides in the world. And these guides um, are very, very helpful. Fishermen use them to identify species and report them to fisheries. And that's pretty critical. You gotta make sure the names are standardized so that you, you have accurate reports of what you're catching. Because if you don't, you're gonna mess up fisheries policy. And that's both at the detriment of the fishermen and the shark say that we make regulations that hurt sharks even more. That sucks, you know, that's gonna well, kill off sharks and all, also have crazy impacts on the ecosystem. But at the same token, you can also make regulations that are not necessary. Say there's a shark that's doing well, but you're misreporting on how poorly it's doing because you're not identifying it correctly. Like, you know, no one wants unnecessary regulations. So like, it goes both ways. It can hurt both the fishermen and the shark. So you gotta make sure that you're identifying the species properly. And one thing that, I mean, I know in my culture that we do, and it really drives me nuts, is we call a bunch of different sharks sand sharks. And I really hate that. Um, and I would never call you out on it. If you call something a sand shark, I'm not a jerk. You know, that's, that's kind of an awful thing to do. Um, but if you are listening, um, please know that a sand shark is not a real shark. Um, it's just a catch-all for any shark that you pretty much can't identify and you caught from the beach. So usually they're attributed to any kind of dogfish, including our pike dogfish, uh, but sometimes sand tigers are called sand sharks, sometimes sharp-nosed sharks or uh, fine tooth or really, again, anything you catch in the surf are called sand sharks. It's not a real shark. So don't, please, please really try to identify whatever that species is. It's just good practice. But anyway, so piked dogfish. Piked dogfish used to be abundant. They used to be everywhere and they used to drive people nuts. They keep getting caught in fishing nets and they keep tangling the nets up and like big schools of them, packs if you will, that's why they're called dogfish because they swim in packs. But big schools of them would just collide into these nets and eat all the fish, eat all the catch, get themselves tangled, and when then when fishermen try to untangle them, um, they'll get pricked by the spines, which I've heard are slightly venomous. I have to check up on that though. But anyway, this is a nuisance, or was a nuisance, because it was everywhere. Recently, piked dogfish have been doing very poorly. Asterisk. And this is what's kind of tripping me up. Um, so the IUCN, um, and if you don't know what the IUCN is, it's the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. It's, a, it's an international, really important standard for shark con conservation. These are the guys who declare species endangered or not endangered, um, and they have varying levels of endangerment, like critically endangered or least concerned, stuff like that. Um, and they're a good go-to, like they're a good beginning, like a good base to kind of get an idea of how sharks are doing. Um, and especially since they have a shark specialist group and they've covered almost every species. They're, they're really, re it's a very good comprehensive tally. But anyway, pike dogfish are globally classified as vulnerable, which is really bad. Vulnerable is almost endangered. It's not quite there yet, but man, that's not a good thing. VU, vulnerable is bad. And locally, in, in my country, in the United States, on the East Coast, they're classified as critically endangered, which is horrible. Um, critically endangered is like the worst of the worst. Um, to give you a perspective, one of the requirements for critically endangered is that there has to be less than 50 individuals in the, in the wild population. Um, there's other different requirements that, don't, that are not population-based, but that is one of them, and it's, it's, it's really bad, right? However, in recent research, there are a couple scientists saying that pike dogfish are doing fine, right? And this kind of is weirding me out because now we have two bodies that are saying different things. You got the IUCN saying that the pike dogfish is doing horribly here, and then you have like American scientists saying, well, no, it's actually doing great. To the point where um, pike dogfish are thought to be supporting seal populations in, um, in New England, in the Gulf of Maine, and subsequently contributing to the rise of great white shark, um, white shark presence in that area. Um, 
because they're eating the seals who are eating the pike dogfish. And in that paper, and I was just reading it today, it's just abundant, right? They, they call it abundant species. So this is what's tripping me up. Why is there a discrepancy? Um, and one idea is that the pike dogfish was really getting to a critical point earlier, um, and then strict regulation has brought them back. That is a possibility, and the IUCN might not be updated, um, which is also a possibility. A lot of the IUCN shark accounts are kind of older, like 2005, 2006, and they'll say on them, needs updating. So that is a very real possibility. Mm. However, there's a danger, though, that I do want to point out. So pike dogfish, like many sharks, um, they are plagued by a very slow growth and reproductive cycle. So it takes, I think it's like 20 years for them to reproduce. And by the way, these sharks live to be 80 or 100. These are crazy, crazy old sharks. Um, but it, I think it takes 20 years for them to repro or, um, get sexually mature. And then, um, I hope I didn't say reproduce earlier. Sorry, 20 years for sexual maturity. And then the pregnancy for these species, um, it's about, uh, gosh, 18 to 20 months. Uh, maybe 24 months. It's basically almost two years. Ain't nobody want to be pregnant for two years. It's crazy. Um, but it's a problem that a lot of sharks face, um, including this one. So when you grow very slowly and reproduce very slowly, um, you do not handle fishing pressure well. And while this shark is growing and reproducing very slowly, our population, the American population, still growing. Our rate of growth has decreased, but you know, overall, Americans are growing more people in restaurants, more people want fish, and they'll order fish, and fishermen will go get the fish and accidentally catch the sharks. So, everybody's still growing. Anyway. Mm. And this is what is kind of tripping me up, because it's like, how can a pike dogfish be assessed as critically endangered, and there are good reasons why, because it's like, you know, handles fishing pressure really poorly, and yet, on the opposite side of the fence, you have scientists saying, no, no, it's fine. It's still fine, you know? And I wonder if the truth is really somewhere in the middle. Maybe critically endangered is too strict. Maybe critically endangered is, you know, politics of some sort or something, you know, try to get management through. Or maybe it's accurate and maybe uh, scientists are overestimating how much, how many pike dogfish are left. Um, and I like to err on the side of caution and say, well, this is not a species to keep, so if you're fishing for it and you accidentally catch it, please release it. Like, this is this is a species that I am personally worried about. Especially since we do have, and we as in the world, not, not the United States, but the world, um, this interesting history of conservation where we will argue that a species is abundant enough to kill because that species poses a risk to... Um, um, like commercial species that we want. For example, pike dogfish are competing with cod for resources, or that's that's an argument I've heard. Um, I don't think it's, I think that was sort of disproven. It's a little contentious, but anyway. But cod is a really great, you know, cod is a big fish. Cod is like a moneymaker fish. And pike dogfish is not a moneymaker fish. And so you have these arguments that, oh my gosh, pike dogfish are just eating what cod eat and just pushing cod out. We got to kill the pike dogfish to get the cod. And that kind of scenario has happened for a lot of different animals. And a lot of times the scenario is incorrect. Probably the most famous example, I'm from the Chesapeake Bay region and people pull that crap with cow nose rays. Um, cow nose rays do like to eat oysters and they've been eating oysters for millions or well, thousands of years. Um, but oysters have declined and it's not because of them, it's because that we've over harvested oysters. Watermen, fishermen, you know, they, they kind of crashed the stock, right? But there's been this recent push of blaming cow nose rays for that decline and then this other push for like, we got to kill the rays so we can have more to fish. And that's kind of not true. You're missing the point. The point being, it's our fault. So I wonder if the same thing is kind of going on with the pike dogfish, where people are like, hey, you know, cod, pike dogfish, compete for the same space, got to kill the dogfish. It's like, no, it's, it's us. You know, it really is us. And you can't kill the dogfish because the dogfish is already on the way out. So you got to make sure you got to keep it safe. So it's kind of interesting how this sort of struggle of, you know, trying to make sure that we use resources responsibly, but also make regulations that are effective, but then also, like, the, the political dance around that 
it, it's a story that you do hear um, a lot in in the shark world. Um, it's kind of interesting. So this shark, uh, there's still more that I need to learn about it, but I thought that discrepancy was pretty fascinating. Thanks so much for watching, and if you like this, please leave a like and subscribe for more interesting shark content, and let me know if you have any questions or if there's anything you want to talk about. Thanks so much for watching. Adios.